Hey everybody, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com, the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. Um, what I don't usually put a very fine point on is the fact that I also have a day job, and that is that I am a professor of chemistry at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. Uh, I've got some great friends online, Frank Wong and Lee Fish, and uh, I think we're going to do a little series here of perspectives on organic chemistry, and my role, of course, would be to give you the professor's perspective, uh, things I think students can do to do a slightly better job when they take organic chemistry. So I've made a list of my top eight uh, gripes about the way that my students approach the course. Uh, I teach about 200 students at Georgetown University every year, and uh, they're great students, but I think they're things they can do better, and uh, I assume those are things that most other students can do better as well. So here they are. Uh, number one, use your professor's office hours. This is the number one most underutilized resource in all of teaching. You've got the guy or gal who is going to write the exam and give you your grade, chained to their desk in their office for several hours a week, just waiting for you to come and ask them questions about their course. And to not do so seems kind of crazy to me. Uh, so the fact that every year out of 200 students, I usually see less than a dozen come through my doors during this time, uh, I'm always really surprised. So professors appreciate it when you come. Most of them want you to come to their office hours with intelligent questions. And when you do, you make a great impression. And you get a lot of good insider information on what your professor thinks is important. And that, of course, is what they're going to put in the exam. So use those office hours. Second. Review your graded work as fast as you can. When you're handed a lab report or an exam, be sure that you take some time in the next 24 to 48 hours to take a look at that work. Because if you don't do that, you're missing out on a great opportunity to learn from mistakes that you still remember making. Uh, if you wait till the end of the semester, review all of your work in what I think is popularly referred to as grade grubbing. Uh, you're not going to get the benefit and your professor is not going to be very pleased when you walk into their office with a stack of papers this high. Uh, my third piece of advice to you is after you've reviewed that work, move on. Don't spend your entire semester uh, ballyhooing and maligning the fact that you missed a few points on exam one. Before you know it, you're on exam three and you've forgotten to study some of that content because you've been so busy lobbying for your extra points back. Be sure that you direct your effort in a way that will earn you the most points in the course, because usually that means that that effort's gonna help you learn the most in the course as well. Uh, number four would be to arrive prepared. That's for classes, for labs, and for office hours if you took my advice in point one. Uh, nothing gets a professor riled up more quickly than a student who asks a question like, can you please explain this again? That will get us a little bit agitated. But an intelligent question that shows that you've reflected on the material and that you've read the material ahead of time will usually get a much more positive response. So if you're staying away from office hours just because you're worried that your professor is going to give you an, a second lecture on your study habits, the best way to do that is adjust your study habits and be sure that you show up with good, direct, intelligent questions to maximize the benefit of that time. Number five, get some sleep before you take your exam, please. I realize that there's a lot to learn. It's alphabet soup and a lot of it, and you've got to soak up all that material. But doing this three hours before the exam when you haven't had any sleep the night before is not going to benefit you. Having good sharp wits about you is a far more valuable resource than getting in that last look at the aldol condensation mechanism. So whatever you do, set some kind of a cutoff, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., whatever it is before your exam, and tell yourself, that's it, I'm closing the books, and I'm getting my sleep at that point because it's more valuable than getting in that extra exposure. Next is get married to your calculator. Talk to your professor immediately if you need to, if it's not already in the course content, uh, like the syllabus, and find out what type of calculator am I allowed to use on the exams, if any. And if you are allowed to use one, be sure the calculator you use all semester long is one that's acceptable on the exam. Because the last thing you want to do on an exam is waste time looking for the natural log button or the exponential button on a calculator that's unfamiliar to you. 
similarly to that is point seven, and that is get married to your model kit. Choose a model kit that works for you, that's of the proper size, that you can put together and take apart quickly, that fits in your bag, whatever uh, criteria you decide are important, and then use that kit for the entire semester. Get familiar with it, know how to use it, put it together and take it apart quickly. Same reason as the calculator applies here. If you're using an unfamiliar model kit, you're wasting time on an exam. And finally, one more point about exams. Be sure that when you approach your exam questions that you always do it in a rational way. And my rational way is what I call the RISER method. R-I-S-E-R. -E Read, identify, select, execute, and review. Essentially, the way this breaks down is read the problem all the way through. Be sure that you have a full understanding of what is being asked. Next, identify the concept or unit on which this particular question is testing you. So when you read a question, stop and ask yourself, what's the professor trying to test me on here? What are they probing here? Get inside your professor's head. Once you've done that, select the proper methodology or equation from your formula sheet or your own knowledge. Once you have selected the proper tools, getting the answer is going to be a lot easier. The fourth step is execute. This is where you put the numbers into the calculation or where you do the retrosynthetic analysis or whatever it is that you need to do to get from the information that's presented in the problem to the information that you need to present as the response. And finally, review. Once you have determined what you think is the correct answer, always go back and check to be sure that it passes the smell test. If you end up with something like a negative pressure, or you end up with a compound that doesn't look like what was being asked for originally, a lot of times uh, students will jump straight to entering their answer before stopping and thinking to themselves, does this answer even make sense based on what I know in general about how the world works? So if you take these eight pieces of advice, I think that you'll have a much smoother, uh, simpler, and more productive semester in organic chemistry and frankly in any chemistry or any science course that you might take in college. So don't forget to come back to the channel and check out what's new as we go through the spring. Take care, guys. Hi again, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the video that you just saw. If you did, I'd like to invite you to check out my YouTube channel youtube.com slash chemsurvival, where you'll find a lot of five and 10 minute long videos, both live and also some really cool animations that I use in my classes, uh, all designed to help you get traction when you get stuck in organic chemistry. So check it out. Uh, let me know what you think. And please, if you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe and share it with your friends. That's it for now. Have a great semester, everybody. I'll see you on the next video.